Devin Harris, how's it going? Hey, Jack. Great, man. Thanks for having me. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing really awesome. Um, thanks so much for coming on. Um, for those who don't know Devin Harris by name, uh, you may recognize the Jamaican bobsleigh team. Uh, <laughs> you were, if I'm not mistaken, the captain of the original Jamaican bobsleigh team made famous uh, by the movie Cool Runnings. All right, so let me correct you. Uh, I was on the very first team. I wasn't the very first captain. I became right. captain afterwards. So I was the captain of the 92, cool. uh, 98 teams. Fine, fine, fine. Uh, but obviously involved in the original ones where, where that was depicted yeah. in the movies and, and, and stuff like that. So um, I'm really interested in, of course, your story of being part of such a huge movement and representing your country in such a... Uh, well, very strange times, actually. I mean, <laughs> crazy concept for, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jamaicans to, to go to the Winter Olympics anyway, regardless of what they're competing in. And um, I'm also interested to see how your story and how your experience going through something as crazy as that has, has led you to become the person you are today and how that translates into you hitting the speaker circuit, essentially, because you mm -hmm. do an awful lot of speaking now about motivation and achieving stuff and living a, a happier, more abundant life, which I'm also super interested on, um, on hearing about. Um, yeah, sure. mm -hmm. So what, what are you up to nowadays? Now that you're, you know, you've hung up the, well, gloves, it's not really a thing. You've hung up the bobsled spikes, somewhere. The spikes, the spikes, the, the <laughs> <ice> spikes. <laughs> what are you up to nowadays? I get to hang out with guys like you, man. That's, that's it. This is my life right here. <laughs> um, <laughs> doesn't get much better than this. No. Um, so obviously, you know, pre-COVID, I was traveling, you know, quite a bit, you know, speaking, sharing the stage, mm. appearing on stages around the world. And I know that there's, there's COVID. I am, um, you know, hanging out uh, in the virtual world, as it were, having conversations. Um, like everybody else learning as well and learning how to pivot my business. Uh, you know, I didn't do much online stuff uh, prior to COVID. I know I'm learning uh, the whole social media world and, mm. uh, you know, just, just trying to become more effective uh, in those mediums. Mm. Well, I guess you've just got to learn a bunch of new pieces of technology, which doesn't take, you know, if you can fly around a bobsled, <laughs> You can learn how to use Zoom for sure. Well, believe me, it's so much easier to, to drive a bob than you pull left to go left and right to go right. That's it. Not too much and you're good. But, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's fun. Um, it's fun just kind of learning, you know, the new, the, the new stuff. And uh, obviously there are some challenges as well in just mm. kind of figuring out you know, it's like what makes one, you know, one post go viral and the other doesn't, right? I yeah. I don't know yet, so. Yeah, well, same. I'm still working on that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start at the beginning because you were in the army, the Jamaican army, or is that, yeah. is that right? And, mm -hmm. you know, and you were, you guys were approached. There was like a call out for um, a team to create a bobsled team. What, what actually happened? What was the official story that actually happened? So, I, you know, if I go back a little bit, uh, you know, I always, I, since I was 15, really, is when the dream of becoming an Olympian got birthed in me. Mm. Um, so I had two big goals. One was to compete in the Olympics. The first one, I, I would say, of more, first and foremost was to, to become an officer in the JDF, Jamaica Defense Force. And uh, so after high school, I ended up, you know, in the love of the country of the UK, England, and walked everywhere because that's what you do at Sandhurst, right? You know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like, so it was my first time out to Jamaica. And I remember, I, I think we were in the South Downs. And I remember thinking to myself, this is ridiculous. You go to a new country to sightsee, but not like this. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> like two in the morning and I'm on top of a mountain and I look and all I can see is just hills, you know? <laughs> um, now, yeah, but that, well, that was my experience in England. And then I, so I'm back in Jamaica, I'm 21 years old and I'm kind of, I'm having this really intense conversation with myself. I'm like, dude, so w what's up? You know, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Know that you have mm -hmm. achieved this grand dream. And I remember, yes, I wanted to compete in the Olympics. So I started training to compete in the Seoul Olympic Games. I started going for runs, hoping I could get fit enough to qualify. Mm -hmm. Run about that time. Two Americans who lived in Jamaica came up with the idea to start a bobsled team. If you have seen Cool Runnings, you'll remember that car that Sanka raced. 
And mm -hmm. they thought it looked like bobsledding except for the ice, you know, two crazy mm -hmm. guys going on the side of a mountain. Um, nobody on the summer team wanted to do it, so they came to the army. Um, and my first reaction, uh, Jack, was, that is the most absurd, ridiculous. <laughs> Anybody ever fancy you? Yeah, yeah. I, and, and I really remember saying to myself, nobody could ever get me to go on one of those things. Mm. And, that, and that's what I really believed until the colonel suggested that I tried out for the team. You know, the colonel mm. makes a suggestion, you know, it's not something that you go, ah, I'll see, I'll think about it, right? Mm. So now I knew I was going to the team trials and I'm just not one to go, well, yeah, you know, I, I, I was at the team trials. I wanted to make the team. Mm. And so I just, long story short, I just went and I tried my darnest and they selected me. And because you were a, is it a mid-distance runner? 400 meters yeah. there, there, thereabouts? 800, 1500, yeah. So my, my, um, I was Jamaican, living in Jamaica, and my, my, my idol at the time was Sebastian, the Lord Sebastian Coe, yeah. Oh, of course, he, yeah, yeah, He yeah. was a man, he was a man at the time, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's crazy that really that the Jamaican... There wasn't a Jamaican bobsleigh team for a while. And the fact it was so absurd is also crazy in itself because you motherfuckers are fast. <laughs> you are quick. <laughs> and well, and we, that's, we can move. <laughs> and that's well, a huge look. part of, of bobsleigh, right, is actually getting that fast, quick, rapid start can, can, yeah, can change but, an entire but, but race. Speed, speed is all relative, right? Mm. Um, because I, I was a middle distance runner because I was frustrated because I couldn't win any sprints. <laughs> you know, so, so, so fast compared to who <laughs> and that's very true it's very true how did you overcome uh training and going through the selection process to join the bobsled team was that uh sort of in the back of your mind that you won the fastest out of some of the people that would have been there and how did you sort of overcome that did you just kind of get out of your mind and just do your best and that's the thing, man. Well, you know, when, when this idea came up, I was what I would describe as army fit. You know, I, I, I mm. just came from England and I, you know, I could walk 100 miles with a, a rifle in my hand and 50 pounds on my back. I wasn't sports fit in my mm. mind. Uh, and I, so I remember this. Uh, the, you know, there was not much you could do physically I, that I believe I could have done physically uh, to improve my chances of making the team. Mm. All I could do was go and do my absolute best physically. Mm. But mentally, I think is where I knew what you know I could probably get an edge. And I remember maybe the week before the trials themselves, going down to the running track on the base, just to like I knew we were going to run like thirty and sixty meters and hundred meters and three hundred meters. So I, I just went down and ran those just to see what it would feel like. Mm. Not and I didn't go all out. I just did it. I'm like, okay, all right, that's what it feels like. Now I know mentally where I'm going to take my game to the, mm. you know, like to the infinite level, just to to bust it out. And I remember being at the trial, seeing all these guys, and uh, man, I was a, I was struggling trying to be in the top four in my head because mm. like you kind of uh, evaluating other guys as they go down. As they, as they do the tests and, and like, I'm trying to get myself in the top four. And then there was this one test, they call it a push test. It's a makeshift sled on wheels and, and you had to push it. And I, although I didn't know anything about the sport, I knew there was one test that was most important. It had to be this one. And I ended up with the two fastest pushes, faster than the fastest sprinter that was mm. there. Wow. And um, yep. They're just smiling. that, just that mindset, just that mindset of believing. Obviously, it got you there. And I guess at that point, you had no idea just how big this thing was going to blow up in your life. At that point, I imagine it was just like you were just joining a club, essentially. And obviously, you knew you were going to have the opportunity to represent your country. But of mm -hmm. course, it, I imagine it's not real for you until you find out you selected and you're actually going to be representing your country, bobsledding <laughs> in the Winter Olympics. Um, do you remember sort of find, did you find out on the day that you were selected or was there like a, a waiting process before you found um, out you were going to be in the so team? The, the, the team trials was uh, over a couple of days, um, three days. Mm. Ended on a Friday. I, I go back to off, the officer's mess and I fell asleep. I was so exhausted, man. It was like, I guess mm. all the physical and mental mm. energy that I poured into that. And I slept through the night. Don't remember waking up not once. And the Saturday morning, I woke up. My friends were calling me the Olympian. 
Uh, because that night on the sports news, they announced that Jamaica had a bobsled team. I was one of the persons named. Um, so I missed that. I missed that notice on the news. In any event, that wasn't an, an official notice, and I, that didn't come until about two weeks later, and it came in the form of an airline ticket. And they go, hey, wow. you're bobsledding. And um, so I was like, yeah, I guess I'm on the team. That's you know, amazing. So I was on the bobsled team, <laughs> although I, I had no idea what a bobsled looked like. <laughs> That's crazy. I remember seeing a photo of you guys seeing a, uh, looking at a two-man bobsled for the first time. And it was only a matter of months until you were actually going to be entering and actually doing a race. So how much notice did you actually have before entering your first race? So our, our team trials were in September 8 to 7. Mm -hmm. And you're right, the first time we saw a bobsled was shortly thereafter in Lake Placid, New York, not far from where I live now. Um, and then we went down a, in a bobsled track, on a bobsled track, in a real bobsled uh, in October of 87. Mm -hmm. And then that November, that, this was in Calgary, and that November we, went, we were in our first race, first race. Uh, a World Cup race against some of the B teams in Innsbruck, Austria. Mm. Yeah, and then, um, you know, we did some more training, went home for Christmas, went back to Lake Placid, New York in January of 88, spent a month there training, and then we went to the Olympics. Wow. You, I, of course, you guys would have received huge support from Jamaica locally. Mm. How, how did you, do, or you didn't? What's the... Uh, <laughs> A huge moral support. Oh, okay, <laughs> but, fine. But no material support. No, no, of, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> I mean, I think the the movie that was probably one of the accurate things that the movie portrayed was ju just how unequipped you guys were in your uh, yeah. in your adventures. And I think that's kind of what makes your achievements so much sweeter and so much more fascinating is the fact that there are tons of countries and stuff with these huge budgets and these uh, ridiculous technology and you guys have come in and really pushed the boundaries of what was expected of you guys um but what was dealing with the the, the fame like for you because you you know you you're a young guy you've never had that before um what was it like the moment you were selected and the news outlets in, in jamaica are, are sort of talking to you and people start recognizing you and stuff what was it like dealing with that yeah um I, I was actually on an interview just before this, and, I, and it's true that I am not one to believe my own press. Not that I don't have an ego and I mm. was flattered by the attention. Absolutely. Mm. Um, you know, you start to obviously see yourself differently, feel differently about mm. yourself um, because of the attention and also because of the accomplishment for sure. Um, but I also saw Bob selling in some ways as, a, as an extension of my military duties. So I would literally mm. take my Bob said uniform off, put my army uniform back on and, and went to work. Mm. You know, so it, it, I, I it, did the whole thing in stride. Cool. And I guess obviously your military background probably prepared you very well for that because, you know, in a military role, it's very business as usual. It's very straight to the, the you know, whatever your mission is, whatever your task is you just get the job done. And I imagine that really did work in your favor and probably prepared you mentally for such a, because uh, it was a mission, you know, you, yeah. being uh, you in know, the- It's interesting that you brought that up because I remember, especially the early days in Canada training, um, I would go back mentally to my time at Sandhurst where we would hmm. have these long, intense period of physical activity, intense physical activity. Hmm with very little rest and then you're at it again. And that's kind of what it felt like those early days. The, mm. Those days were long, man. Mm. And I would, you know, kind of mentally go back to Sanders. I'm like, oh, it's kind of like this. Let's just do it. Yeah, so the so, Army experience definitely helped. So what, what role were you playing in the bobsled? Were you, were you driving it? I'm not really sure on the, the different no. roles. What, because, of course, you, we have the movie to go by. Um, but in this crazy fictional world we're living in, nothing really is as accurate as it should be. Um, mm -hmm. So there's no character in the movie that really is you. I'm sure you can choose one which you think is closely relatable to you. Um, but the real Devin Harris, what, what were you doing? What was your role in the actual race? I was, uh, so on the 
on the, we, we started out with two men, uh, Bob Slay, and I was the brake man. I was the guy in the very back. Mm -hmm. When I got in the sport, I wanted to be a brake man because the brake men mm -hmm. had to score more than the drivers mm -hmm. uh, on, the, on the test. And knowing nothing about the sport, I thought that was the important role on the sled. So I wanted to be a brake man. Mm -hmm. And then I got in, I realized, you know, brake man, brake, the brake men are disposable, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. I'm like, can I be a driver? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to be honest, I was too scared that, that first year to drive. So right. I was a great man in the, in the Olympic race. On, in the four-man, I was a number two guy cool. on that four-man sled. Yeah. And then in the, in the sub, two subsequent Olympics, I was a driver. I cool. Oh, of course. So in, in the race, the, the crash, you were second man. I was a second man. Of course, man. yeah, that's, that's obviously why you I came was, out second walking. I was walking. <laughs> the scene of the crime, but I didn't, I'm not responsible for that. <laughs> yeah. I bet you kind of wish you didn't drive now. Or maybe you did. Maybe you'd have finished. Who knows? Um, so anyway, so you go out to the Olympic Games and, you know, I imagine your lifestyle changes dramatically. You're living the hotel lifestyle. I imagine you, you interviews after interviews and reporters after reporters you're making television experiences which would have been very new to you at that point how did you you four as a group um you know was it the, the movie shows all you know sunshine and rainbows and of course a, a few pinch points otherwise you know the storyline would be super flat um what was it like sort of living with each other and being on the road in such this sort of life-changing circumstance was it all pretty smooth you all got along very nicely um, hmm, um, for the most part. So, uh, of the first four, the very first mm. four who were selected, three of us were army and one civilian guy, um, mm. Samuel Clayton, who rest in peace, passed away, uh, this March from COVID. Mm. Um, he was my driver at the time and uh, the only civilian. So, so th there was always kind of this, uh, uh butted head. He mm. claimed. I remember him, uh, one of his complaints was that the soldiers were ganging up on him. So it was <laughs> so much easier for the three of us soldiers to kind of just get on with it because, as I said, it was kind of like a mission. Yeah. And he wasn't of that same mindset, and we were trying to mm. pull him along, and he was mm. not always willing to go along with us. So we, we had some, yeah, we, we butted heads, especially he and I. Um, he being my driver, and, and I thought we had a lot of potential, man. I, Sammy had really had the potential to become a good driver. Um, he just didn't, in my opinion, mm. um, wasn't interested in focusing the way you needed to focus. So mm. he and I used to butt head on that. So by the by January of um, '88, he was no longer with the program. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um. So it comes to race days and you're um, at the actual Winter Olympic Games. It's all built up to this point. And, you know, I, I remember seeing an awful lot of um, footage of you guys watching every single uh, race, every single starting point, you know, watching diligently, trying to learn as much as you can before you hit the, uh, hit the ice. Uh, what did you learn just before uh, the race that you didn't learn from training that you, that you didn't learn from, you know, actually learning about bobsledding beforehand when you were actually there in the moment, uh, observing and trying to figure out what everybody else is doing. Were there any sort of big learning points that you actually took into your race that you, that you learned from that observation? Good question. I, you know, I've never been asked that before. Um, I don't think there were any aha moments. Mm. I think what we learned was just, um, more the vibe, the side, the, the the mental mm. side of the game. You know, mm. you just you just saw how uh, people carry themselves differently. I mean, understand that this is the first time in since we're in the sport we're seeing any of the big players or even medium sized mm. players mm. in our sport. And the, the Olympic Games itself uh, themselves are a very different animal. It's so intense. Um, mm. There's and we had nothing really to prepare us mentally for it. So even as we're trying to pick up a tip here and there, and again, there were no aha moments, but I think mm. I took away was just um, mentally and just kind of emotional, how people carried mm. themselves. Yeah, I and guess. Sort that in and try to, mm. to get that back. 
I guess just being a part of it, understanding that you're on these guys' levels and, and it's normal for you to be there. And, you know, you need to try and not have too much of a separation between whether or not you feel like you deserve to be competing with these people. And I guess that's a, a difficult thing to overcome. And I guess once again, you know, your military background would have really, really helped with you understanding your own capabilities and your own value, because that's what that training is all about. Mm-hmm. You know, you knowing you're a bloody badass and you can get the job done. Um, and it's really interesting actually for you to explain the differences between the one uh, person in your team who was a civilian and the differences between your mindset and the things that we can learn from that military mindset that can be brought into, you know, daily life in order to make us better and more motivated and successful people. And I, I think there's an awful lot we can learn from the military and an awful lot of stuff that can bloody stay there as well. Um, mm-hmm. And it's yeah. transferable. Um, so it's, it's race day. Were you, were you nervous or would it, what, what, where was your mind at? Is it something you just wanted to over and done with or were you just lapping up, really living in the moment or it would just go by in a flash? There were three things I would say that was happening um, when I was there. One was first and foremost to compete and be at your absolute best. Right. Mm. And then the other was the learning that we just spoke about, just kind of, watching and trying to see what other people were, were doing mm. to see what you could pick up for whether it was a really great teams or the not so good teams mm. and then the part then there was another part where you you're kind of sitting there with your mouth wide open going oh mm. so that's oh that's wolfgang hop here that's it's kind of like you know you, you go to the world cup and you're like what that's mm. ronaldo that's messi yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know because we've never seen these people before, you know? Yeah. Um, so we're trying to balance all of those. Now, when it came down to actually competing, I would say that, um, I mean, every athlete is nervous. Um, mm. For me personally, you know, even in high school when I raced and even when I knew I was going to win, I was still a nervous wreck until it was time to go. Mm. Um, you know, so I was always a nervous wreck. And then once they said the track is clear, I mean, hey, it's time to go. It's time yeah. to go. You can't afford to be nervous now. Let's go. Got to go to work. Uh, that's... Yeah, work time. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, that, that's exactly how I describe it. It's mm. work time. Mm. Yeah. That's a good mindset to have. And I feel like everybody doing something challenging who were nervous or worried about failing uh, and are letting negative thoughts win at the time where they should be focusing the most i think it's very good advice just focus on the job you're at work no matter what it is whether it's something you're being paid to do or whether it's something you do for fun you're at work and we've you're there to get the job done and emotions need to be put aside and then you need to go out there and fucking crush it and obviously that that really paved the way for you guys to really make a mark on the on the sport the movie there was a few scenes in cool runnings which depicted um, some very tense, tense moments and tension between uh, the Jamaican team and other teams. Um, mm-hmm. What was it actually like in real life? Were, were you kind of, you know, received in open arms or were you really seen as a bit of a meme country? You know, how, how were you actually received by the other teams competing in the Winter Olympics? Yeah, so, so n- nothing like you saw in the movie. So I remember... Uh, when we were in Calgary initially, the, like all the Olympic hopefuls, all the bobsledders were Olympic hopefuls were in Europe. Uh, mm. So you know, the guys that we saw, they were more like club guys and, um, you know, fun weekend warrior mm. kind of bobsledders. Um, and then I remember we over, were over in Eagles, Austria, and one day this mm. British Army truck, bobsleigh truck, rolled up, you know, all the guys rolled off. <laughs> from the British team, a bunch of them were black guys, and they're like, "Hey, where's the Jamaican posse?" <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, "What's up?" You know, <laughs> kind of stuff. And so we started hanging out with the Brits a lot, and um, mm. the, the Aussies were there, and they were, you know, they're just some crazy bastards. Mm. Um, <laughs> you know, they were like, "Hey, let's go play a cricket match in the gym, get a, get a tennis ball," <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but what, what I know is that, generally speaking, athletes are supportive of each other. They, mm. They're not as mean as, it, as, it, as depicted in the movie. Mm. Um, 
And by the time you get to the Olympic Games, man, look, nobody has time for that, that kind of energy. You're trying to win the most important race in four years. Mm. You know, and I, I tell you that they'll be more focused on, and they were more focused on what they were doing as opposed to, mm. if anything, they were probably thinking, well, we know we're going to beat them. Um, <laughs> yeah. I remember mm. uh, what, one of the moments as I sat in the, we call it the warm house, where you hang out and, uh, before you go down the track, mm. you know, all bright eyed and bushy tailed, my mouth open wide looking around. Mm. Um, this East German guy, um, Wolfgang Hoppe, who was at the time the best in the world. Yeah, he was the biggest. He came in to, to prepare and he took a break um, and handed me an East German pin, just kind of smile and no words were spoken. Mm. And that, that, you know, what that said to me is like, hey, saying, hey, welcome to the brotherhood, man. Yeah, man, you're welcome. welcome. To the welcome to the mm. Olympic. Mm. Uh, and the worst part about that story, Jack, I have no idea where the pin is. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, terrible, terrible. No idea where the pin is, man. Uh, you but never I, know. But he's a cool dude that, you know, and it's back in, you have to also understand that the, what the world was like then. It was mm. at the height of the Cold War. Mm. So the, the East Germans, the Russians, none of the athletes behind the Iron Curtain spoke to anybody anyway. Mm. So that was really out of character in many respects for him mm. to do that. Mm. Um, and you know, years later, after the wall is down, and I said, I, I think he, I think he was either a captain or a major in the East German army. Wow. Yeah. It goes to show, like humans are bloody good, really, man. Outside of their own individual cultures and own individual social structures that influence them to behave in certain ways, that people are generally cool dudes by default. And I think sport really does show that in a lot of ways uh you know in, in olympic games and world championships when so many different countries come together um it just goes to show that like the default human behavior isn't racist or isn't of conflict or isn't of uh, of um you know aggression or tension and uh, you know it must have been amazing for you to be a part of actually witnessing just how welcoming especially in the you know the late 80s man i mean you know people were super stupid yeah. and intolerant <laughs> at That's that time you know, so i remember being in the village man in the game arcade so of course you know we're kind of time stamping mm. <laughs> the games because we didn't have the cyber cafe we had a game arcade right and i'm um, mm. I mean, they're killing the Pac-Man, you know, I'm a Pac-Man. <laughs> <laughs> and off to my left is a guy from, uh, from Poland and off to my right is a guy from East Germany. Mm. And again, freshly minted army officer from Sandhurst who was trained to believe that everybody behind the Iron Curtain was evil. Mm. As I'm looking at these people who are the enemy and they're mm. evil, I'm realizing, you know, they're, the only real difference is ideology, and it's an ideology that's give, that has been given to us. It's not one of our own making, mm. um, and, and that they suffer from the same human frailties and foibles that I did, mm -hmm. and they harbor the same aspirations. They were there, are similar aspirations. They were there to mm. compete uh, and be at their best for their mm. nation, as I was. Mm. And, and so, yeah, that was, you're, you're right. I mean, our, I think our default position as human beings is just to be good and mm. kind mm. There, there's so much more that connects us than divides us i agree and i'm glad that's the thing um at the end of the day we're all products of the information we receive and at the most important time where that matters is when we're young um mm -hmm. and impressionable yeah. or yeah. just transitioning into adulthood and i think that's where an awful lot of these different negative mindsets are sort of interbred in, in, into people um I, I like to feel that you know humans by default as they begin the life is tolerant towards every everyone and every every walk of life and every different experience um before we get into the the race and the, the crash how were you guys funding yourself because of course you didn't get much support obviously from jamaica in terms of mm -hmm. funding and uh, as you mentioned material stuff um how were you guys uh, because of course you would have had a level of funding where you were paid to travel around and you were put up and I imagine you were fed and stuff like that. But of course, when you transition from the life you had before to the life you have now, I imagine there's an element of you also kind of wanted to live in style and wanted to sort of live in the moment as much as you can. How did you fund that kind of new <laughs> lifestyle? Selling t-shirts? What was the... You're a funny dude by living in style. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> 
fuck. So, um, yeah, we anticipated that we're like the, like, like the, well, the guy, George Fitch, the American guy who came up with this idea, mm-hmm. he anticipated that once word got out that there was a Jamaica bobsled team, companies would be totally in love with the idea and the mm-hmm. millions of, of dollars of uh, corporate sponsorship would come. Mm-hmm. It never did. And so I remember us, um, to, to give you a little bit of context, we're in Calgary, George was the one who was bankrolling most of this. And um, Black Monday hit, I think it was October 17th, 1988. Uh, and tons of people lost a lot of money in the stock market to include George. And he says, hey, we had a team meeting. He says, you have a choice. You can go back to Jamaica and wait until the funding comes or you can stay here and try and figure it out. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that, it was in that moment that Jamaican bobsled team really got solidified. Because I think if had we gone back to Jamaica, you never would have heard of us. Because mm-hmm. the fun never came. And I remember one day, man, it was so cold and the training was so hard. I'm 22 years old. And all I had for dinner, all I had money for was one chicken leg, one roll, and a small soda. Wow. Couldn't even supersize it, man. Um, and then I remember being over in Europe, and by then we had created the T-shirts, um, and we were over in Europe, and we'd go to clubs at night, and we'd boogie up beside a couple and go, hey, with a bag of shirt, or hey, you want to buy a shirt? You know, and the, the guy says no, but then the girl says yes, and he ends up paying over that <laughs> So, so of yeah. course you got the level of hustle as well, which would have been a learning curve as well. Yeah. Think. Oh yeah. It was, uh, you know, I don't think that's something I would have done on my own, but it's just mm. one of those things like, Hey, let's, we just kind of work together as a team. And mm. we, we just went out and we, we hustled man. So shirts, so we could eat. Now, that's, a, that's, a, that's an amazing story. And it also goes to show that just because, you know, you, you put on this, huge pedestal on on the big stage and you you're on the news and you're making these huge appearances it doesn't mean that you know you you get to live you know, living the high life and, and and even still today there are issues with um olympic athletes and how they're funded and and the sponsors they're allowed or not allowed to have in order to monetize their lives so to speak and mm-hmm. um i do believe that needs to change um but it's really interesting to see how obviously you guys were kind of it's kind of a bit of a rags to riches story in a way. And although, you know, you didn't go into riches in terms of monetary stuff, but in yeah. terms of what you guys achieved winning the hearts of, well, the entire world really at the time was that's worth more than any amount of money. Um, as I'm sure you'd agree. Uh, uh, Trading some of the hearts for a little money. <laughs> yeah, no, <big. laughs> <laughs> so uh, the big race, the, the yeah. main one, um, you guys were up, you were very, very fast, overwhelmingly fast. And I remember everyone was excited. The commentators couldn't believe what the fuck they were seeing. Um, do you know how quick you're going? Or do you only really know the split times and the finish time once you finish the race? Yeah, only, only after you finish. So there, there are certain runs when you go and you go, wow, that feels quick. But you, right. you don't know. You, you're not hearing anything. So you don't know what you're doing. Mm. Um, so, 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 you know, I tell you about that day. It was one of those days, man, where, you know, if you're superstitious, you go, oh, this is a bad day. So wow. we, uh, as usual, we leave, the, we leave the, the village on the on the, on the the bus. And I think it was Michael who had left his helmet. One of, one of the guys left their helmet. So we had to run back for that. All right, cool. Helmet in hand. We're good to go. You get to the track. Dudley, who is a driver, he goes off to walk the track. The drivers walk the track every mm. day. And the three of us, you know, deal with the sled, stick it on the truck, take it to the top of the track. We're in the warm house, kind of chilling. And Dudley finally walks in, finishes his truck walk. He looks unhappy. What happened? He fell on the ice and sprained his collarbone. Oh. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so no, we're, we're tied with the Brits. Uh, so Roy, I think his name is Hunt. Roy Hunt from the British team. He was a physio because we didn't have any of those things, right? Wow. It's like, we, we can hardly afford food. <laughs> that one, like, right? <laughs> Just get around selling shirts on the ice yeah. to see if anyone wants to help. Yeah, so he comes <laughs> over with his magic spritz yeah. and, and, and patches him up. And wow. then you know, we kind of think everything is good. Mm-hmm. Years later, I'm discovering that as we're standing at the start, getting ready to go, mm-hmm. 
George Fitch comes to Dudley and complains that our coach had left the Olympics. He had to go back to the US to go to work. Now, okay, that might be something that's upsetting, but you know, we're at the start of the race, dude. That's not the time mm -hmm. to, to relay that kind of information. Yeah. So, so we didn't know any of that. Wow. Um, so so it, just, it was one of those things where, let me, let me back up again. Because most people that have seen the movie Cool Runnings and they mm -hmm. think that we trained as a four-man team for the entire time. No, mm -hmm. we started the four-man training the week of the Olympics. Yeah, wow. Because you all wanted medals, right? You all wanted to achieve yeah, yeah. the same uh, thing that, and you all wanted medals. I was medals. the one who kind of said, that, hey, that, I, I remember that. So, hey, let's, let's do four months so we can all win a medal. Like, yeah, 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 let's do that. <laughs> and so, uh, when you're young and foolish. And so, so we recruited Chris Stokes that week. Chris had never seen a sled before that week. And, and so in three days, we taught him everything we knew about how to push a bobsled. Mm. Right, so understand this is not a team that's been at this forever and ever. Mm. This was our first week, mm. really, because it was <laughs> yeah. Christmas first four days. I don't imagine it took took you long to teach him everything you knew at that no, point. I don't know that much, exactly. <laughs> um, but there were some changes. Like I was supposed to be the guy in the spot where Chris was, mm. but it was too difficult for him to learn how to get over the side. So I gave up that mm. spot um, and ended up pushing on the side. Mm -hmm. So it's the second day of the race and we, the, it, it, so, you know, it felt good. And anybody who has ever like done athletics will know, like they'll have a run and they go, wow, that felt good. That felt fast. You mm -hmm. know, just know. And it worked beautifully. It was like, I described as poetry in motion. We just got in the sled, bam, 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 bam. Mm -hmm. It just felt awesome. And um, we left the rest up to Dudley. So as we're heading down the track, I remember we got off corner eight and we hit the wall and I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, it's okay. It's a long straightaway between eight and nine, we'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And then we hit the wall again. And I knew we weren't going to be fine because we, you missed, we missed what you call the take on, that part of the corner where you're supposed to enter the corner mm -hmm. curve. Um, so I expected the sled to do the wave, right? Kind of up and down. And if you watch the, the, the footage, you'll kind of see the sled going in and out of the camera frame. Because mm. um, they have the camera kind of trained to the center of the corner. To right. kind of in and out. So I expect us to go all the way around, um, waving, as we call it, and then slam into the wall and be on our merry way. So as I'm waiting for that slam, I did feel a slam, but it wasn't my hips, it was my head. Oh, man. Because <laughs> it I, looked I, violent, for sure. Yes, it does. It, to be honest, you, you know, so I've often heard that the best spot in a four-man sled is behind the driver. That's the most comfortable ride. And I, mm. and I had a fear of crashing in that four-man because I felt I was going to be claustrophobic. Mm. We went over and my thought was, oh my, we're over, how embarrassing. That's all I was thinking. Mm. The rest of the world was seeing this and we just crashed and we just gave credence to everybody who believed we had no business being there. Um, so, I, you know, at no point did I fear for my life. You know, mm. a crash feels like forever. So you just kind of, and there's nothing you can do, but go mm. for the ride. So, you know, we just kind of, went along for the ride and then the sled eventually came to a stop and we got out and, you know, we had to cross the finish line. Uh, so we had no finish time, but even if mm. we did, man, we're, we're so far behind. Mm. You could probably foolishly think you were in first place. Right. Mm. Um, but, but this, the, the Olympics were essentially over for us then. How was the walk from the sled to the finish line? I mean, I know in the uh, movie it was really dra dramatized in this, you know, this big, rewarding thing but the actual footage shows like that like, people were behind you man you you won some fans for sure what was that like you know you get out of the sled you realize you know you're all fine um what was that walk like for you because i imagine that's a very defining moment in your life yeah uh, so i was leading the pack and we were just trying to exit stage left mm. man um or in this case stage right mm. and um feeling very dejected feeling like failures Mm. Uh, we just did this in front of the entire world, you know, and we were from a country that's been nurtured and Olympic excellence. And here we were embarrassing the entire nation with this crash. Um, 
And then uh, I, people just started to cheer. Mm. People started to cheer us. And I remember one guy reached over and shook my hand and I shook it. And then I had to shake every other hand uh, down. And so like if for that moment, uh, for that, you know, how many, 20, 30 seconds, you know, their, their appreciation kind of blunted the, the pain, mm. um, made it feel better, just a, just a little bit. Um, but, you know, in the moment, you're kind of stunned. You don't know what to say. Mm. Uh, and I'm like, I was actually, so I was supposed to, I think it was ABC. I was supposed to go on camera to do an interview to talk about the crash. Mm. And I, you know, so when I Jama- I tell you this now, when a Jamaican tells you soon come, worry, because it could be five minutes, it could be five days, five weeks, <laughs> <laughs> five years. You know? So I, t- I told them soon come, and I ha- they haven't seen me yet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think I hope they're not waiting. <laughs> instead, you're on my podcast instead. I'll uh, consider myself yeah, very yeah. fortunate. Because the thing is, I mean, Jack, what do you say to someone after you just failed in front of the entire world? And yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I had no words, man. Mm. So I, I, I gave them a soon come. Wow. And how, how uh, what happened after? Was it just, you get back to work? You, you know, your life yeah, is so usual? We, we're kind of, we, honestly, we're really worried. We're really, really worried. Mm. about going home because we thought it would have been ridiculed. We thought people were just like, you, mm. know, you bloody idiots. Um, but people were so supportive, man. People were making excuses that we didn't even accept for ourselves, like the mm. fact that we're from Jamaica and we did a winter sport. And, mm. and you know, because we, we never saw the fact that we were from Jamaica as a liability at all. Mm. We, we just refused to accept that we can't be good at this sport because mm. we're Jamaicans. <clears throat> Excuse me. But yeah, but people are making those excuses for us mm. and just being supportive, uh, you know, to the point where the government made stamps with our faces on it. So, you know, that Wow. Was, That's amazing. Cause you, you were making, what were the times that your, that race was looking at? Cause you, you were doing extremely we, well. You run for a very good time if I remember rightly. Yeah. We were, we came off the hill with the seventh fastest start time. Um, so one of the goals that we had was to be competitive at the start. Mm. You know, we knew we didn't have the experience really to, uh, and a lot of people thought we're gunning for a medal. I, I would respectfully disagree. Mm. I, I don't think we're in a medal running, but in on that particular run, and that's a challenge too with, you have to understand bobsled driving, a lot of it is feeling. And, it, you know, for those who have driven a car, you'll know two different cars feel differently. Mm. Um, and especially when you're so close to the ice, it's, it just make, it, it really emphasizes the, the need to have the feel. Mm. And so Dudley was driving a sled that he was not really used to. We had it for maybe three days. And then here we come off the hill with a seventh fastest start time. It's like he's seeing a brand new track. Mm. And, and I don't know if he was distracted by the fact that the coach had just left as well based yeah, on that yeah. news that he got. So it's just all of those was like the perfect cocktail for rest, for for disaster. Mm. So you come home, Jamaica is receiving you back with open arms, still very much celebrating you. And, you know, I guess you go back to work. It's your life is as, as normal. I imagine you're still dipping yourself in and out of the bobsled world and, and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then all of a sudden, someone makes a movie. Uh, kind of about your life definitely the, the subject but you, you know how hollywood gets um i uh, how did your life change from that point because you know there was one thing dealing with the fame of representing your country um you know in the olympic games but then what happened after the the, the movie was made i'm not sure when it was made or how how soon after mm. it's a matter of years how did that change your your life in in that in other ways so the, the, it, the movie took five years for them to film and i remember you know friends with us are they filming the movie and like I, I don't know like every six months they're filming or oh, they're not filming and mm. eventually got frustrated i'm like whatever if they film they film i didn't care mm. um i thought i didn't care um so so it's kind of interesting because when they were filming this movie i was uh working as a cook in a kitchen in the bronx new york I'd, I left the JDF as a captain and had moved to the U.S. and was just trying to 
find my way around, right? And mm. so that was within that first year um, of being here. And um, then I got, got a call, hey, they're filming, would you like to go? So I, I got a chance to go on the set in, Cal in Calgary. It's really cool, obviously, to be on a Hollywood uh, movie set. Mm. It's really flattering to be on a Hollywood movie set, watching them film a movie about an important part of your life. Mm. Um, you know, so it, it's just one of those things. Again, I'm proud of that fact, but I take those things in strides, man. I just like, okay, mm. cool. It's really cool, I think, mm. to have a movie made about you. But, mm. you know, the movie, the movie, the whole Bobsell experience is, a, is an important part of my life. Uh, it, it, it represents some defining moments, mm. but, but it doesn't define who I am. Of course. You know, um, and so uh, that that's kind of how I just take it. Yeah, there's a there's a movie. Yeah, it was about. I actually don't say the movie is about me. I mm. I, I go a great pain to say the movie is about the team that I was a part of. Of it's course, my story. Yeah, and of course the achievement as a as a country as well. I mean, the mm -hmm. it's really a Jamaican. It, it's it's a celebration really of Jamaica. That movie. It feels like a, a big tip to the hat of something that may well have if that movie wasn't made kind of just been under the radar for, for 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 many people and that's the great thing about hollywood and movies is that you know they 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 do get some information out there on certain topics and, and events that may necessarily if I, I maybe would have never have known yeah you know a, a, about it um mm -hmm. so you know, you don't push any bobsleds now, although you do look in amazing shape. Do you, what do you do now to stay in, in, in sort of shape? It's, it's a shirt, dude. It's a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, since doing these podcasts, I've realized that I only need to train my arms. I, got, I could just let everything, see, man. <laughs> I could just, I let everything go, just a black t-shirt, and I can't the, lose. All <laughs> all <laughs> yeah. What do you do now to stay in shape? I do, I do some push-ups every now and again. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I try to work out, you know, consistently. I, I, mm. So my knees are shot. Um, mm. and I, I tell people I used to be six foot, seven foot tall and invincible, and you know, <laughs> this is all that's left. <laughs> so, like, uh, you know, I did, I, I did a workout yesterday, and I'm going to do, I have a little trampoline in my garage, and I, and I go run on it. Yeah, fair, fair, fair. But, but, so it just like, you know, it absorbs all the shock, for, you mm. know, and, and so I, I'm able to do that. I have a little, have some weights in my, in my garage because the gyms are closed. Mm. Uh, and if they're open, I'm not going, not yet. No, no, no. Uh, you know, I, I do a little something, nothing, nothing crazy. I'm not trying to get to the Olympics. Either. Of course, but I guess now it's just a case of looking after yourself. And, you know, especially I imagine when you get to your age, you, you start really valuing being healthy, especially when you have, you know, friends and stuff around you. You get into my age. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I joke, I, I, you know, I say, you know, when I, when I was younger, I tell my friends, I'm going to be a fit little old bugger. Now I'm just an old bugger. <laughs> it's like, it's like, so, so wrong with the plan <laughs> so now you are um speaking an awful lot and yeah. you i've watched a bunch of your stuff you've done a tedx talk as well which um yeah. was real funny <laughs> i i was watching it and i remember at the beginning you, you said to everybody uh, people always ask me what character i am in the movie and you were just like i'm this guy and the picture of like the, the coach comes up there the white coach. Right, right, right. <laughs> how do you um you clearly really enjoy being on stage and sharing your stories and, and lessons and inspiring others. What, what, what made you go into that? And did, did it always feel comfortable for you? Did it always feel natural for you to get on stage or was there a learning process? Um, I think I've always been good at public speaking, actually. Mm. Um, I remember being in the army and whenever we had these presentations and often I was like the most junior person and, you know, the, mm major or whoever in charge of the project will go, you know, Devon, you, you do the presentation and a good speaking voice, mm. according to him. Um, so I've always been comfortable on stage. I've never, I've not always been comfortable telling my story though, mm. um, especially uh, because I grew up in a really rough neighborhood and, you know, you know, violent neighborhood, you know, impoverished neighborhood. I was never always comfortable telling that part of my story. Mm. Um, so I got, as I was working to get back to the Olympics and now I was living in the U.S., 
and trying to get back to the Olympics in 98 in Nagano, I met a guy who was an, uh, uh, an agent for some reggae artists and he started to talk about becoming my agent and it sounded really cool because I'd never have had an agent before. Mm. And, um, and I started to tell me about this thing called motivational speaking, which for some reason I never heard of before. And I said, yeah, that sounds good, I'll do it. But after the Olympics, the, the military thing again, selection and maintenance of the aim is the first mm -hmm. principle of war. Oh, did I let, just let some secrets out? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I've gone past the time. I can say. Yeah, I think you're gonna be all right. Um, but you know, Jack, his, you know, they say some people come into your life for a season or a reason. I, mm. He did absolutely nothing to help me to get to the Olympics. But he told me about this thing called motivational speaking. And so, uh, you know, now I'm working with some other people. I'm like, hey, after the Olympics, I'm going to be a motivational speaker. I don't even know what that means. Mm. And I remember being in Calgary. And if I look on my bookshelf hard enough, I'll see it. I went to a supermarket and, it, and there was a book that said, uh, put your money put your money where your mouth is or your mouth where your money is. I, I think it put your money where mm. your mouth is. And it was about breaking into the speaking world. I'm like, ah, so I bought that book. Um, long story short, I would go to the Olympics and I come back and I start speaking for free and rotary clubs and schools and whoever would listen to me. And then, you know, I, it just kind of grew from there. Um, I really, and en I enjoy being on stage. I really enjoy encouraging people. Mm. I really enjoy um you know challenging people inspiring them to be their best and if if it means telling my story uh and i'm fortunate to have a story that really transcend barriers that you know people are, are all across the world can really do relate to in fact mm -hmm. i remember being in in vancouver in 2010 and i was speaking to um shortly after that to the the actually two other guys on the team and i said I think I'm only beginning to understand the impact that our team has had on people. Because I met this woman from Eastern Europe who was, uh, once she discovered who I was, began beginning to tell me how much our story had impacted her life. Mm. And you go, wow. Um, we're just trying to represent our country. But yeah, it, the impact is so much bigger than that. It does. It does. I mean, you're clearly very, very good at at speaking and the way which you communicate is extremely clear. I watched a bunch of your stuff before you coming on. And I, I find the story extremely motivating. Like I feel like I, after watching all of your stuff, I, I want to do something crazy and stupid and try to achieve something which could, I could never even imagine I could do. I don't know what that is, but it, it fires people up. It makes you want to achieve some shit, whatever that is. And I feel like if, if people share more, people like you share more of their experiences and more importantly people listen that people are willing to put netflix down or, or no their soap operas down and actually go out there and listen to stories from real people in the real world you can find inspiration absolutely everywhere to better your life and actually draw energy from other people's experiences to go off and chase your own dreams it's almost like listening to people like you gives you an emotional blueprint like a map that people can follow to becoming the type of person that is going to achieve their vision. And um, that's why I think that the work you do is so important, so important. And you're clearly very good at doing it. And uh, I appreciate you're doing it. Um, what next? Are you just going to, you're just going to keep going, stay on the circuit, keep speaking. And uh, you know, cause you clearly yeah, have a passion I'm, for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so COVID has, uh, caused me to really rethink this obviously nobody is traveling and speaking so mm. and i have not done this over the years you know, create uh you know virtual programs audio programs you know stuff mm. online so that's kind of the next i guess step uh, evolution as part of my speaking yeah and then you know my foundation work is really important to me um the keep on pushing foundation Mm. Um, and so, you know, I need to, I intend to spend a whole lot more time because the last number of years. So what's, what's, of, what's keep on pushing? What's, what, what's the, the foundation? So we created a foundation here in New York that, that does work at my, this, this is England, right? So I can say mm -hmm. primary school and they'll understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to a, a US audience, I have to say elementary, elementary school. Elementary school, yeah. <laughs> 
So my primary school, which is in the middle of the, the, the hood, the inner city, mm -hmm. um, a number of years ago, I was speaking to the principal and, you know, I asked him what's the biggest issue, challenge that kids were having. And it was that many of them were going to school hungry. Wow. So we started a breakfast program at the school, uh, we have a school supplies program. We just built a sick bay. And, and the goal is to grow that work, um, you know, um, start creating some um, digital training and all that stuff to better equip them for the new, brave new world that we're mm. living in. Mm. And so the goal is to grow that across not just my neighborhood, but the island across the Caribbean into South and Central America, kind of this hemisphere. So there's a lot of work that um, that, that entails, as you can imagine. So yeah, of I'm course. I'm going to be very busy. Amazing. Well, look, I look forward to sort of keeping up to date. And uh, thanks so much for coming on. Quick question before we end this. Did anyone in the bobsled team actually have a lucky egg? No. <laughs> Not a physical lucky egg. It's a, again, it's a metaphor. <laughs> I'm not sure what it would be a metaphor for, but uh, we can use our imagination. Uh, Devin, you're awesome. You're clearly very good at what you do. I really appreciate you coming on the show. And uh, look, good luck to you. Keep smashing it. And um, we'll speak soon. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me, Jan. Thanks, man. Catch you later. Yeah.